this this is for me is the most uh, scary moment. Does it really work? Okay, we are live. Welcome everybody to a meeting of um, uh, the International Days. We have a huge group coming from different countries, reaching from Ireland to Norway to the UK, the Netherlands, uh, meeting up and with Turkey, uh, almost forgot it. We're going to talk with you. Uh, we're going to have an emerging conversation concerning how can we best care for the unique patient within evidence-based practice course health to the rescue so we're very pleased to have a lot of people from course health and from different spectrums here so um you will get to know us during the conversation uh so don't worry and uh let's see how it goes well unique patients and how to care for the unique patients there's always something it sounds so easy and also sometimes so difficult Raj, what would you say if we take upon such a topic well, I think um, the first thing is the you, the word you, the words unique patient. We're meaning every patient because that's the assumption of um, well, it's a, it's the assumption of medicine and medical research, and it's definitely the assumption of causals that every every patient is unique, and by that we mean they have a disposition to unique, meaning in, in individual. Um, uh, factors which relate to their pain so the causal factors that that um, either cause their pain or cause them to get better are are, in, are individual to them um, the, I suppose the assumption of medical research is that uh, so, so Steiner's last comment comment there that, that patient care is one thing research is another thing I think you know that that underpins the whole the whole cause health um, philosophy as well and the assumption I guess the other stance is to say no that's not the case that that um, that, that population-based research does does readily relate to the needs of, of each patient otherwise why do it um, um, and I guess the, the, just the, the tiny bit of background to that in terms of a sort of single philosophical problem if we was to identify one is is the problem of induction like how how do you infer findings from a population study to an in, individual level well evidence-based medicine has got some ready-made replies to that and responses to that that are to do with 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 averages and and, and a get out clause of well what what's the alternative then and thing things like this um and i guess the I guess one more thing is that the the idea of cause health and examining where we are now in 2021 is not to not to be dismissive of 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 everything we do. You know, the evidence based medicine movement has been phenomenally successful in lots of different ways, and. And I guess, I mean, Ronnie will comment on this as well, and she might have some differences of opinions, but I guess it's looking at what, what population research has to offer and how, how we position that with, with some of the suggestions and developments we're, we're working on with, with cause health. So one of the criticisms of cause health and the N equals one slogan particularly is that it's um, it's anti evidence based medicine, and that's not is that's not the case of all. It's you know this is a philosophy of science project in my mind. It's about how do we advance the science behind uh, providing the best care for each individual patient, and population level evidence does come into that, but it it, it is only part of the story. Where the um, the efficiency, I suppose, the selling point of evidence-based medicine is that actually, if we if we if we just do enough big big stuff, if we do enough big population-based research, we have the answers to care for to care for everybody, um, and we don't we don't we don't think that's that's the case. 
Um, so how do we care for, how do we best care for the unique patient? It sounds like quite an inefficient thing compared to evidence-based medicine because we're, we're all sort of badgering away on our own, working out the best for each, each single patient. But um, again, it's relative efficiency we're talking about. And uh, how, how, how do we do that? So I don't know, Yus, what, what, what would you like to do now? Are we thinking about patient? Are we bringing in uh, Chris as our, our patient? He's got a wonderful story anyway. I think, well, this is kind of interesting, as you said. So there's a tension. That's, I think that's the first thing that we now talked about. Right? Unique patient is the population data. So what's the tension in evidence-based practice? What's the tension in... Um, uh, dealing those two different sides to it and what's efficiency. I think that it's most important to make it clear from what we talk about and maybe then it's nice to have a, a, a talk from a patient perspective. So what is a unique patient? Would you agree? Would it also be for uh, the upcoming colleagues on the table? Do you agree to make it more feasible? So what we talk about, is that, uh, yeah? Chris, can you? Can you step in? Uh, yeah, so I probably need to do a bit of explanation about, a very brief explanation about where, where I come from. Um, so I had a manual handling injury about 12 years ago, prolapsed disc, I have sciatica, lots of neuropathic pain. Um, I was in a really bad way to, to start with, couldn't walk properly, couldn't sit and all that sort of stuff. Um, first four years of my persistent pain journey I was treated by loads of clinicians and I reflect back on that and I look at it as being actually I received a lot of what I call routine care um, and I'm convinced that it was evidence-based um, I'm convinced that guidelines were followed um, but it didn't work for me I was still in a dreadful situation. I was on lots of medications, injections, surgery, all that sort of stuff. And it wasn't until I was treated in a more person-centered way and somebody got to know me, got to know my story, looked at me as an individual, and yes, took the evidence-based um, population data into account took the guidelines into account, but really treated me as an individual. And that made a huge difference um, to my life and to my ability to, to live with persistent pain. And I can't, be, I can't be the only person in this situation where by you know, the evidence, I'm not an average patient, I'm not, I'm me with all my um, dispositions, um, my social life, um, or my other comorbidities and so on. And I needed to be looked at as me, um, with good clinical judgment, good evidence-based, but as an individual patient. Do you want me to say any more? Yeah, no, that make that, well, Chris, that makes sense. So now we have set the scene a little bit more as Paul was, you mentioned and Paul mentioned it here. It has to take uh, both you, the person centeredness into account, but also the evidence and the public data, the guidelines. So what's what it is, and you felt this difference. Isn't it, there's something, there's something extra into it. Yeah, there, there is, but, but actually, I don't think it's, I don't think it's too difficult. Um, so to me, it is about getting to know the person, um, not putting the evidence to one side, but, but looking at me in my environment, in my work condition, not just in the clinic, not just giving me core exercises to do because that's what evidence says that you should be doing for sciatica or, or for back pain, but actually, helping me live and understand my condition um, in my life. And, and for me, actually, learning to understand my con condition was, was a huge breakthrough. And it was a huge breakthrough to learn to 
understand what was affecting my pain. Well, it wasn't just my prolapsed disc. It was actually my work stress, the way I was sitting, um, you know, my genetics, my tendency to anxiety. And that's where all the cause health causation dispositionalism came into it as well. And if you have that understanding of what's going on with your body and, and so on, I call it, I have a picture in my mind of, of all these different factors that are contributing to my experience of pain. Well, once you've got that holistic understanding, then you can start to learn to self-manage it. And I adapted my life. I adapted what I do on a minute by minute basis, basically, in order to, to manage that pain. Whereas of course, for the first four years, all I thought was actually, my prolapse disc is causing the problem. And if nobody else can fix that, then I'm, I'm in a difficult position. But actually, if I look at myself as a wider person, as my clinicians did, then there are things that I can do. And there is a way of, of living well with pain. Oh, thank you. That's, that makes sense. That, the, this, this kind of set the scene what we talk about so you give it a way not a little bit a way more grounding then actually in this case i would maybe would nice to have a, the clinical perspective next with matt so if matt can follow it so it, i think it would be nice to have first to set the scene from the from your perspective uh, christine and from matt as a clinician into it so then we can dive a little bit in the philosophical background with Rani because you also mentioned you and Roy both mentioned quite a lot of uh, philosophical background we have to dive into but maybe it's good to have a little bit of understanding concerning the the clinical and the physiotherapeutic thing uh, in the way of working. Matthew? Thanks Joost. Um, so I guess we could probably tackle this next bit from a clinical perspective in terms of from a as a clinician what do we trust to make judgments? Um, and I guess you could look at things in two different ways. Uh, one way is how do we think things work? How, what do we think causation is? If we're gonna make some kind of decision, do we assume that it's a certain way? That's the first direction of a conversation we could go. And the second one is to what degree of scale do we look at things? Do we look at things at populations and then average of statistical evidences and use that to say, well, on average, this is likely to work or not. Uh, do we scale into the clinician's experience and say, well, these types of things have worked for me in the past and you seem quite similar to different types of patients I've seen in the past? Or do we look at the individual case and then do we focus on their history, the context, the cultural and social situations of which that uh, manifests from? And then how do we organise all of those different, how do we prioritise the different sources of evidence. What do we see evidence is? Do we see evidence purely in this way that um, we can abstract uh, things about Christine uh, from large scale randomized control trials where you're looking at difference making? Or do we look at personal narratives and how do we check ourselves in terms of human beings being, being able to deceive themselves incredibly well? So, um, so, so things like, well, you know, Christine's got back pain sciatica. She's got a directional preference towards flexion. This is appealing to some physiotherapists out there. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a certain type of exercise with a certain type of directional preference under the assumptions that's going to help with the symptoms. And this kind of, so what do we do? We, do we lean ourselves towards this kind of algorithmic way of thinking about things? So do, are, do, are our clinical reasoning and judgments based on algorithms or do we have to be much more psychologically, socially and uh, 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 clinically reflexive in order to make, thing, uh, make, make clinical decisions based on a cl clinical case? So you can see I'm talking about multiple types of things here. Um, and, and I think personally, if we scratch down to the surface, uh, scratch past the surface and come down to the, to the first point, which is how do we think, um, in what way does reality exist? Uh, uh, is it that things happen uh, through causes that happen regularly uh, and uh, with contact uh, and are uh, 
have a temporal priority. So I can trust this because I've seen this happen lots and lots of times and this happens and then this happens, therefore causation happens. Um, if we see things in that way, it's going to shape the way in which we make judgments. If we look at it in a different way, again, that will make us shape our clinical decisions in different ways. And I think perhaps at the heart of, of Course Health is to take the emphasis away from large scale population data, which in itself has some underpinning assumptions as to what makes that true, uh, and spins it on its head and says, actually, well, we should consider the individual case, all of the context that shapes that, in in including the social cultural environment and the way in which we can communicate with that person and their history, that has causally relevant information. And then we look outward to not deceive ourselves. Uh, and so it's this way in which we can look at degrees of scale in terms of clinical flexibility uh, uh, and uh, be able to approach a situation which is not deterministic. If you have a diagnosis, it doesn't mean you have to follow a certain clinical algorithm. Uh, that If you have a neo way, then you do certain particular things. Um, lots of uh, causally relevant information means that you can there are infinite spaces of possibilities which potentially shape the clinical encounter independently for every individual patient um, as opposed to we follow the nice guidelines in a very particular way and this is what we do with every single patient that's not to dismiss uh, uh, guidelines at all guidelines you know i'm not going to start saying well let's use bloodletting as a reasonable treatment it doesn't make mechanistic sense and you know it and, so, and that's the other thing about Cause Health is, is it pulls in mechanistic uh, elements. So it, we're looking at this in a very pluralistic way where causation uh, can be accessed in lots of different ways, where there is a drive towards a similar t uh, direction. And that gives us far more accurate, I think, information with regards to uh, helping individual people. Does that make sense? Yes, definitely. It definitely makes sense, Matt. I think that you described very well the tensions in how, well, I should put it, how do we think in uh, what does, how do reality exist in the audience about cause and, uh, cause and effect? It's between in, uh, indefinitely, infinitely, uh, or very narrow. So there's a kind of tensions that you constantly have to work upon, and it's not either or, but you have to integrate and everything. Or as Roger is saying here, uh, uh, the patient holds causa causally relevant information but this challenge what we and evidence-based uh, medicine mean by causation and then we get into kind of the words so some words were mentioned already in between causation dispositionalism uh, causality cause and effect I can imagine that uh, did some of the people around uh, in the in the meeting also now start thinking? Okay, well, I'm a so it's, it's a rain shower of uh, of elements uh, diving onto me. It would be nice to unpack a little bit what we talk about, also the course health. Rani, can you uh, bring us on? Yeah, because um, I mean, what we want to do in course health is to uh, is to explain. Uh, from a conceptual and from a, a philosophical perspective, why we think that the person-centered approach is the right one and why you need to treat everyone as an individual. Because when we talk to clinicians, they say, well, every patient is different. And if we really take that seriously, then we cannot start with a model that says that the same cause will bring about the same effect in the same conditions, because where, where are those same conditions? So the only place you have the same conditions would be, uh, for instance, in a model. So you can draw a model and you can plot in two, three factors and you can predict with accuracy what is going to happen, which is never the case in the lab even or out in reality. And it's definitely not the case in the clinic. So what we want to do in cause health is to say that, well, actually, there is a different way to understand causation, which would give you uh, a, a way to talk about causation in the individual case. And, and that's by saying that causation happens when different properties interact. So, for instance, if you, if you think of the simplest way, you take a pill for your headache and you might think that, well, the intervention is the pill and you are the background conditions. And then when your headache goes away, that was the effect that you were expecting. But of course, it will depend on what 
uh, features, what, what, what properties I got, because I'm the one interacting with the pill. The pill on its own does nothing. So that's why we talk about mutual manifestation partners. So the properties of the pills and the properties of me, they have to interact causally in a causal process for any kind of effect to occur. And when something interacts with completely different context, we should expect different things to happen. And so that's why we talk about um, that's why we talk about disposition. So for instance, you can take a, I always talk about the match uh, and you strike the match and that might be the cause, you know, the intervention that you can observe and then the match lights and you're happy. But of course it's going to behave very differently if it's raining outside or if you're uh, pouring it into uh, a pond of, uh, of uh, gasoline. Uh, so in one case, nothing will happen, you know, and in the other, you will have a big explosion. So, so if we think of a treatment as something that works in a particular way under certain conditions, we should really be interested in those conditions. And as, uh, as uh, Roger and Matt and Chris have already said, so that patient will, will bring about most of the costly relevant information that you need to know. But in addition, you need to understand how does your treatment work? Because if you understand how it works and not just how often it works in a population that is studied in some clinical trials, you will also be able to predict better whether it's going to work for this uh, person. So, so that's the thing. That's one thing that we, we talk about in cause health is that we cannot just look at when we get the expected effect in close to ideal or normal or standard conditions. We really need to study those cases where it doesn't work. So for instance, in Chris's case, she's such an important source of causal information because if something normally works, but here you have a unique case where it doesn't work, that can really help you look at which contextual factors, which mutual manifestation partners actually are contracting this treatment, getting the expected effect. And that's why we're talking about N equals one, because you can start with the idea that the same intervention should give the same effect. Um, and you can look at the population where maybe you have 30% that gets the expected effect. And you might think, if only I had a population with only those 30 people, 30% uh, people, it would be 100% success. And then you could say they all have the same conditions. But the point is that all these statistics is showing is what happens in individual cases. And not every type of individual is included, which was like one of my first shocks with Roger Carey when he said that, well, most of his patients actually weren't included in the clinical trials. So why assume that the that the evidence that comes from these patients, who are individuals, by the way, that that evidence applies to the, in, the individual in front of you. I mean, if all you know is the statistical data, yeah, of course, then you can only assume. But, but causal evidence is not about just counting how often things happen. It's about understanding how and why. Great. Thank you, Rani. This kind of gives a little bit more fundamental in what we talk about and also uh, the difficulties and what we understand. Paul, you had a, a comment. You had something there. Yeah, no, I think it's very interesting uh, what, is, uh, what is said. Um, and Roger started, is it not efficient to not be evidence-based in the beginning? And for me, uh, I think there's a, a, a difference between being efficient uh, to evidence-based practice, which is much more uh, based in, uh, in, in an audit culture or being efficient towards your patient. And uh, for me, it's interesting to divide between a more complex world, which is a patient, which has his own historicity, has his own context, uh, his own individuality. And uh, on the other side, um, you have a, a, a complicated uh, world uh, where you can predefine the outcomes and make a linear uh, causal unidirect relation. And if you if you do that, then you can. Uh, it's that's very nice for policymakers, for financiers, because you can really nicely uh, audit that and test that. Uh, 
Uh, that's for me efficiency towards evidence-based uh, medicine. Um, but if you take the complexity uh, uh, in, uh, in perspective, you look also towards, towards the future. You are having a caring relation and all these elements are constant, different forms of evidence basically are constantly weighted in the situation and in time. Um, and I think that's what Matthew was explaining very, uh, very nicely. Only he, he almost, uh, he, he put it as a question. But for me, that's a very rhetoric question, because I think if you talk about complexity, if you talk about people living their lives in their lives, then um, you can't do anything else than take in perspective, in time, all these re interactive uh, relations, things are emerging, uh, 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 things are popping up, you have to deal with. So then uh, for me, uh, uh, the way Matthew, that was his second proposition, I think, uh, it can't be anything else in truth. Daphne. Something, something, I think it wasn't uh, expected. No, you can continue. Thank you. And what, so, so what I, what I think is that uh, we should uh, um, ask ourselves, are we thinking in a patient as a complex, uh, uh, as a complex issue? Or is it a complicated issue where we can predefine outcomes and make stepping stones? And if we can do it, uh, and that's how we, how we perceive, especially visual therapy, I'm very curious how our occupational therapist is thinking about it. I think they are quite naturally already thinking much more from this complexity perspective. And we have an occupational therapist uh, in, yes, our, yes. in our midst. So I would, I, I would ask him, uh, uh, but, that, but that, that makes a big difference. Yes, and, and to, to, to start, thank you for this question also, uh, uh, to start with your last remark about, do we have to think about uh, complexity or a complicated? I would say uh, if, if we as professionals say it's complicated, it's first of all about us. Uh, yesterday evening, we had a session about uh, the narrative of uh, a pain patient also. And there we said, uh, if, if we don't understand the, the patient, we often say, oh, it's complicated, but it's about us. And yes, I, I strongly believe we have to view to a, a person, and maybe not say patient, first of all, to a person as a complex uh, uh, well, issue yeah, with different dimensions and, and to make the link also with a narrative. Yesterday we talked about uh, everybody has a, his or her own narrative and within a narrative there are different storylines. And yeah, we have to understand all the different storylines. Uh, as Christine also uh, mentioned, uh, um, in the beginning she was treated uh, well, with what you call routine care eh, and probably also based on evidence. And on a certain moment, it, it changed into person-centered care. And then you said, well, and that was really about me. For me, it sounds like, well, one storyline, a very important storyline was forgotten. That's the self or the me or almost identity. Eh? And to understand that line and also the medical line and the evidence line, et cetera, et cetera, I would say it is a complex thing we have to understand. And, and uh, Christine, you also mentioned uh, at the end uh, something about self-management. Uh, uh, I really like the concept of self-management, which is about, if you look to the word, managing yourself, and you can almost put it on identity level, eh? identity self. And if you, well, unravel the concept, uh, it's also described in several papers, self-management at least has three dimensions. Medical management, how to manage the medical issues, but that's not the only thing. It's also about social or role management, how to manage daily activities. And often that's what people say, hey, what I do is what I am. And the third dimension is emotional management. 
and also to understand self-management that's also it's difficult it is a complex concept so again to come back to your question paul i think we have to look at the person we meet as professionals as a complex issue can i can i can i just come in on that please, please. so i i think you're absolutely right but i would actually add that um yes clinicians need to to understand the person as a complex ish, um as a complex person and a hundred percent their narrative is so important and that needs to be listened to because certainly for me i think that was one of the things that was missing in my routine care but i would also say that there's there's something really powerful about the therapeutic relationship so it's not just about the clinician understanding the complexity it's about the clinician and the patient working together to understand that complexity together and to support that patient in understanding it for themselves. Because once they can understand it for themselves and, and see all the causal factors in a much clearer light, then as you say, they can, they can self-manage that. Um, and I call it supported self-management, hopefully with the help of the clinician um, and move forward with their lives. But I just wanted to emphasize that the, the therapeutic relationship, the therapeutic alliance is just so important. And it's so important to help the patient understand the complexity as well. As well. Thank you, Christine. I think this is a nice contribution in this between a complex world and a complicated world that this, the complexity has to be done, seen from the different participants or the element it also seems that the people in itself are also kind of in a, if I'm correctly at this position, that within the complete world of interaction, can I say it in this way, Rani? Does that make sense? That we have these people like here? If we just go a little bit further, in, we, in the meantime, we have a conversation in, in a chat, which nobody can see, but except for the ones who are in here. Uh, so Evie posted something. So I just wanted to put it to Evie. Sorry. Um, yeah, no, what, what I was posting was that to me, it feels as if, you know, it feels as if um, when you take this philosophical viewpoint of dispositionalism into account, to me, clinically, it doesn't feel a huge lot different from looking at your patient and recognizing that there are many different factors that go into whether or not your patient is going to respond to a treatment or not. So it's not, I, as far as I can tell, even working within the evidence-based paradigm let's say and before I heard about dispositionalism let's say um, it doesn't feel a huge lot different to me to say there are so many different things that could be influencing whether such and such a thing works for your patient but I, I think I think the difference here from what I can understand is that Ronnie is oh, I see Roger's hand is up go ahead Roger well no can continue I was just going to add something that you know to to contribute to what you're saying at the end but do, do continue we, we got to a bit of the chatting but i see that my chat uh, is disabled now that's why rani i would have uh, messaged you back but uh, i can't type anymore in the chat thing um probably because i was typing too much i don't know um but um but 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 what i was thinking was that it doesn't so i'm you know because since um encountering this cause health material i've been trying to reflect a bit on how has it actually changed my approach to patients and as far as i can tell I don't feel like I'm doing in practice anything very different to what I would to what I would have been doing before I realized that there was a different, you know, ontology and, and all that sort of thing. So um yeah, I just wanted to put that in the chat box. So the, the only thing I wanted to say to that, Evie, is that I, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, when when I when I started on this sort of venture and when I first met Rani and, and Stephen Mumford, um I was very much looking for a, because I was very interested in clinical reasoning. I've done some stuff with, with Mark Jones who taught some clinical reasoning modules. And I was looking for um, an, a, a theoretical explanation that underpins our, the way we clinical clinically reason. And that, that I, th I think that's one of where I f first started to get into it. And I still think that, I still think a dispositionless ontology better explains what we've always done. Like for, for decades, for, for, for 
hundreds of years probably, the way the good clinician works is better explained by disposition, dispositionism. The problem is, as soon as you bring um, the, 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 the tenets of evidence-based medicine in, that shatters because they're, they're based on a different understanding of a, a regularities theory of causation, which doesn't fit neatly with the way the good doctor works or the good clinician works. And, and, and that's where I came across a sharp contrast. And that's essentially what a lot of uh, our work in cause health has been trying to do to juxtapose the ideas, those ideas together. But, but, you, but you can't essentially, because the they are two different ontologies and an uh -huh. ontology is the very nature of, of existence. So you, you can't just say, these two ontologies sort of slide together and work okay. So what you're what you're describing is is what we would think is good practice and good person centered medicine. Like you say, it's essentially what we're talking about in dispositionism. But the, there's this huge contrast as soon as we try to integrate um, information from from a world where there's a different idea of what 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 is meant by by causation. Yeah. I think um, I think myself and Ronnie talked a little bit about this before, before and I think um, I think that I might not be the only one who got interested in the Cause Health Project more for I suppose pragmatic reasons that I was saying okay this is this is what I do clinically and look at this project is telling me that I have a really good theoretical basis um, for doing what I'm doing uh, so I I think I said something to Ronnie along the lines of that it's as if the Cause Health Project is really telling us what we what we would like to hear, what we hope is true um, about the world. Um, so I, I sort of approached it from that side of things, but the more you think about it as it sinks in, for me anyway, without having much of a background in philosophy, I'm starting to understand that, no, it's, you know, it's, not, just, it's not just sort of jumping on the bandwagon pragmatically. This is actually, there's, no, there's, there's something deeper to this. Like this is actually how causation works. It is yeah anyway sorry my views are not very well formed on this um but yeah no it makes it makes sense i think it makes sense evie and also that you say you start something with from a pragmatic view and then you dive deeper into it so you, you go uh, below the surface so you you try to uncover what's what's the iceberg uh, below it isn't it there's something more into it and i think that's something which is nice to do also now that we dive a little bit into different directions Maria, you raised your hand. Yes, thank you. And uh, thanks for a good discussion. Uh, coming here with a viewpoint from a slightly different angle. Uh, I'll just say that I come from, I come from medical research. <clears throat> it's my, in my background. And uh, as uh, Ronnie talked about also the models we use, we are I'm very used to, to work with models. And uh, putting this into this context, it's, uh, it just hit me also listening to the to the causality project. I, I think that we sometimes also misunderstand each other in different professions and different fields, because uh, as a researcher and especially in a, in a basic research, we see that the models we use are sometimes taken out of, of context and used uh, very differently than they were meant for. Uh, and we can call it bad bad implementation, I, I would say. Uh, and I think, I think uh, one, one solution to get closer into how to use research data, also in the clinic, I'm, I don't have clinical experience, so I'm not, I'm not so familiar there, but I'm learning. Uh, but I think I, what I see sometimes is that you take data found in research and you put them into a totally different context. And then maybe uh, after that, criticizing the model, but the model was never intended for that. It, it was a huge step between those. And I think a better understanding of, of uh, research from clinicians and a better understanding of clinic from researchers, uh, and, and of course, many are doing both. I think that it's one way to understand this complexity because, because um, saying that uh, also me, we would never say that this leads to that, even if we are often criticized for that, we'll just say that this leads to that if everything else is like this, 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 and then there's maybe a thousand things that we cannot control. Uh, so I think sometimes we maybe simplify 
um, other people's work too, and we take their conclusions without really understanding the context. Did you understand what I meant now? Uh, so I think constant discussions and constant understandings of how how we think and what is the background of the models that are made and models that are used. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, this, this makes sense uh, to me at least, Maria. Maybe Rani will try to, will uh, uh, react. Oh yeah, yeah, I've been, I've been chatting away. <laughs> 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 no, because I mean, yeah, these models, uh, uh, what I say in the, in the chapter is that they are so powerful because, uh, and, and that's why, you know, you have the, the, you have the standard model of causation, which is almost like the billiard balls, you know, you have one billiard ball, you hit another billiard ball, and then that other billiard ball will start moving. And that makes us think about causation as a monocausal thing. It's just one cause, one effect, one meeting, and everything is done. So that's why we wanted to bring in uh, the vector model with all these arrows and stuff. And I think one way that um, it's different with the dispositionalist view uh, than looking at different factors is that very often those causal factors are generated again quantitatively with how often something happens. So it sounds almost like if something happens in 90% of uh, the studied population, it's a 90% chance it's going to work for you. But if you have a qualitative understanding of probability, that number is going to, if it can even be a number, is going to depend on you and what type of intervention you're bringing in. So, so it will always depend on that unique interaction. So the unique um, probability for something working or not is not going to be generated statistically. And that's why we have these slogan statistics don't get me. Uh, because how often something happens has nothing to do with how strong the cause is. It says something about how common <laughs> yeah. uh, a certain uh, causal process is in that population. And, and I think it's also a huge difference between you know, saying to clinicians, we should be informed, you should be informed by uh, research and saying that research needs to be informed by the clinic. Because, so this is what Eliana Roca, uh, my colleague is always saying that actually the clinic generates really important research. The information we get about Chris is really important for developing research on that condition and which treatments are best. Okay, yeah. I'll just comment back there because I think what you do there is to explain how to how to use statistics in in a good way because I think it's it's a lot about we talk about good practice and it's a lot of bad practice and we can use we can use statistics in a good way and in bad ways and everything in between and the same with models and the same with uh, guidelines and it's about learning to use use all our tools in a good way and not in a bad way, to be very dualistic there, but then. But me, Maria, at the same time, I have the feeling that what you just said and same thing, interaction also between the clinician and the researcher, between the clinician and the patient, you have both sides. And now we look upon it like uh, they have to get the consensus, but maybe they also have to have the dissensus with each other to find where, where they struggle. Because uh, those tensions that actually came out of it create something new. It seems to me that uh, what we now talk about is we look upon it from different angles. So it's not like the, the one is right. You have two rights at the same time, and then we have to merge them into together uh, because this is a constant interaction, which is very much, is that also what you meant? Absolutely, the, the, and yeah, and saying right and wrong is very, <laughs> it's not a good way yeah. of saying it because you're right, there are many, many rights. And I think it's to understand um, something about understanding each other's uh, um, um, side or, or, or uh, see it through other yeah. people's glasses, all these things, uh, and understand how to use it in a good way. Um, and not simplify. I think sometimes, and that is maybe because I'm uh, coming from a, a science background, and sometimes I'm told that I'm, I am too uh, deterministic about things. And I say, no, but this is not how it was meant, but it's also how things are implemented sometimes. So it's, it's also about understanding each other's 
way of thinking, I think is uh, very important there. Yes, thank you. I think this is interesting. Um, Aisa. Uh, depending on the uh, Rani's um, speech, so uh, I want to mention that I, there's something confusing about me. Uh, so I apply some methods in the clinic and I have the chance to uh, apply it in my research. So lately uh, I, uh, we did a research about uh, tapworm mandibular diseases and uh, in the clinic, we use uh, a very valid diagnostic criteria. Uh, and uh, the clinician use this criteria uh, to diagnose, uh, to find the cause of the problem. So uh, if we hear the click sound, so it means that the disc is uh, placed in the anterior to the combat. So um, it's a very specific and uh, very valid, 87% uh, valid diagnostic criteria, but we had the MRI images. So uh, we had, uh, depending on the click sound, we had 40% false uh, repositioning of the disc among the patients. So uh, I, I really see that this um, evidence-based practice and uh, the, um, the diagnosis cannot fit to uh, each other. But, uh, I was blinded to the diagnose and I didn't know about the MRI uh, results and I did the treatment. I did the osteopathic treatment to the patient. So uh, patients had the symptom, patients had the pain, patients had some limitations while using their temporomandibular joints. So uh, depending on their symptoms, on, on their problems, I uh, just make a pro program, a treatment program and applied it. And at the end of our uh, research, we saw that uh, even there was a problem, uh, the evidence-based problem with anterior dis displacement or not, uh, patients had improvement in their health quality, improvement in their, um, uh, in their joint uh, sinusal space uh, objectively. And, uh, had some improvement with their symptoms. So um, I guess it is very important to depend on something on an evidence uh, to work in evidence base. But sometimes uh, we don't know what we are treating. Uh, as we know in the clinic, the click sound uh, can be related with the anterior disc displacement. But uh, as we um, uh, just see in our research, it's, it may not be the problem. And we don't know uh, that it is the uh, base of the problem, but we uh, treat the patient. And sometimes um, I have some patients with knee problems, uh, had the same operation with the same surgeons at the same time, same environment. Uh, the right knee just heals uh, very good, but the left knee had an edema with the same protocol. So. Uh, the complexity also includes the person itself, uh, how it used, how it loads, uh, and uh, our clinical evaluations may be um, important in this complexity. Uh, I don't know, does it make sense or relate a bit the subject, but uh, this complexity of the patient uh, just may differ uh, to the results of the study and uh, being an evidence-based uh, just cannot uh, be related with the correct results or uh, that's a correct cause, uh, so. Thank you, Aisa. Yeah, so you also stressed the, the difficulty in, in uh, this complexity where we constantly had this tension between those elements. And I think that circles kind of back to uh, a question which is coming up in the chat uh, from Evie and Maria entered it. Uh, Evie, because it, I think it's nice to, to get it out there. Oh, sorry, I was, I was just furious. Sorry, so, away, no, I understand. I understand. <laughs> so, and then you can, if you just put it out there, and then Maria can respond also in the conversation that makes a little bit more sense, probably. Sure, I, I, was, just, I was just putting it to Maria. I was just wondering if maybe, um, if maybe when we're talking about the patient-centered care model and the importance of, um, you know, uh, 
treating the patient as a whole person and, and taking a really, a really holist view of the person. Um, I wonder if uh, sometimes when people do that, they're maybe not giving full, full credit, I suppose, to evidence-based medicine, or maybe that they're misunderstanding what evidence-based medicine is actually saying. Um, I don't think that evidence-based medicine, I don't think it was the intention with evidence-based medicine with that movement to say that, you know, everybody needs to be treated um, the same all the time. I don't think it was the intention of that paradigm to um, to go against uh, thinking of people as individuals either. Um, so I was just uh, asking Maria if, what did I ask? I can't remember now what I said. Uh, something like, um, uh, let me see. Do you, do you feel like EBM is sometimes misunderstood by people um, who advocate the, the patient-centered model? Go ahead, it's, it's a very good it's a very good thank you and i think that it's a very good question and and uh, now i say that i i actually know very little about ebm <laughs> because i i'm not a clinician myself so i'm not sure how it how it is implemented all the time but but i have been thinking just walking around in in a clinical environment i, I worked in at the university uh, educating clinicians and what i sometimes react to and maybe think of is this this way of thinking a bit in boxes. And now we think evidence-based medicine. This is personalized medicine. And I, I am sometimes thinking why, why maybe it's not necessary to make boxes of it. That that as you say, we that evidence-based medicine was maybe made to to answer one question. It doesn't mean that it answers all the other questions. It just helps on this point. And then we have to find something else that helps for the other thing. And I think, uh, I often also think about it when I listen to, to what people talk about research, what model do you use? Uh, and I think that this that is not the interesting thing. The interesting thing is what questions do you have? And how do you use your toolbox to answer this question? And I think also evidence-based medicine is one tool. And then the other one comes in the chain. So maybe I think I, I cannot speak for others, but I think maybe we sometimes take models a bit too literally that we think they can solve all our problems, but we need to give them uh, more color and uh, personal person yeah, personalized setting. I don't know if that answered it, but uh, uh, yeah. yeah no, that, that's exactly the lines I was thinking mm -hmm. of. Yeah. Great, right, thank you, Sana. Yes, I just, uh, I'm glad Maria said something that sort of introduced what I was sort of thinking of because I'm uh, dealing with education and students that are sort of coming into the education with uh, an expectation that I've created out there with uh, perhaps more so techniques and things that you, when you see physiotherapists in sports field, for instance, you see them with a, they do a few things and techniques and then it, that, that's physiotherapy and, and how and the challenge is how to how can we sort of um, introduce physiothera physiotherapy to the students and in a way that meets their expectations but still uh, looks to the complexity of this and it's uh, most i think educations now it's unless as we in bergen do <clears throat> starts with a <clears throat> sort of basic things so it's quite concrete <clears throat> physiology and anatomy and <clears throat> and treatment techniques, which is sort of dealt with sort of uh, into the joints and uh, <clears throat> which gives the, um, and that, that's, that's the first year. Uh, and, and that gives the students perhaps um, they, they miss, can then easily sort of misunderstand what physiotherapy is and the complexity that is there. And how can we sort of introduce all these complex, complex uh, things in, in the first year? when they haven't got their, their sort of, um, in, in a way you, you need to have, um, to have um, uh, an understanding of what you're doing and you can't introduce all these things, psychology, f philosophy, and all these things into the education from, start, from the start of it. It's, it's very difficult. And uh, <laughs> there's a cat there. <laughs> and um, that's something that uh, we are sort of always discussing. And evidence-based medicine, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's discussed a lot in, in our education. And one example was, for instance, with, with the massage. So the, well, it doesn't work. Uh, and, and then it's, uh, well, what does massage or touch 
what does it really do with the patients and what sort of in to to, to have this um, interaction between the patient and how is it used and, and you can be a bit sort of uh, categorically say no it's not working because uh, from one study it, it does didn't work that's that's on the population okay a long talk but it's that's what introduced something about the education and the challenges we got oh this is nice uh steiner i think that we definitely have to we we, we will circle back into education because i think that you mentioned the dilemmas and also from an educational perspective and luckily, we have some educationalists and we have some upcoming professionals also on the table, so which we can go into. So we will circle back there. Uh, first, uh, then Paul. Yeah, very interesting, Steiner. Uh, I, I'm really an advocate in starting in complexity because otherwise you are just building up all kinds of reductionist frames in the head of, uh, of students. Um, but maybe it needs to be parallel. So but we will talk about that later. Uh, I just wanted to come back to Maria. Um, she was doubting if we should really oppose towards uh, evidence-based uh, medicine. Um, I, I do think that we need to take a stand though, because it's a very uh, clear uh, cause and effect uh, causation, uh, which doesn't uh, represent the way we think. Um, and there's a whole politics and a whole industry behind it, uh, which uh, I think is not um, working for the cause of physiotherapy or for any health profession. So I, I really do think that we should change that paradigm towards, uh, well, what we're talking about today. Uh, because what is nice, Joost, I feel that we're quite in line with each other. So we, we are trying to give it words and 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 to, uh, to make it comprehensive, not simple, but comprehensive. But we, uh, we are in one line, I, I feel, so that's nice. I'm happy. If I can <clears throat> just answer that, because if, uh, uh, then I also understand more, more about what uh, evidence-based medicine is. Because if it's, I also like Roger said, if it's, if it's really so that it's meant as a, from those who made has, has made made it as a box. This is how it is. Yes, then I absolutely agree that you have to have to uh, discuss it. Uh, so it's. I think it's more about my surprise that this is how. It, it's a bit of a surprise that this is how things are viewed from a model kind of way. But it's just because I come from a totally different, um, totally different field and we're not way used of thinking models like that it's not so so i think maybe maybe actually clinical practice can learn a little bit from the heavy deterministic natural sciences where we where we tend to look at models as actually quite quite flexible yeah uh, it, it i think it was uh, uh, in the starting of evidence-based medicine it was like that second was very clear in that you had judiciously weighed different uh, sources of evidence, but then you saw that we really forced a bit more into uh, deterministic empirical analytical research and uh, and with all the evidence-based uh, uh, policies behind it. And I think that's what we, we, we also have, can't be naive in that. Those policies we have to contest, I think. It's representing something different than mm. that we want to work with our patients. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I think this is nice that we, uh, we circle back into it from we learn to know each other more. And as Maria is saying, from what's actually the value base, because we constantly talk also from uh, decision making towards value base below it uh, from different angles, how we can learn and also how we view upon each other and how we view uh, on ourselves. And, and also at the same time, how we view on ourselves and what we put upon the other, uh, like Maria is saying in Paul now with um, research and everything. Going back to Sigurd, your hand was up. Sigurd, you're muted, sorry. Can you unmute yourself? Thank you very much, thank you. Uh, I think I wanted to start with Evie Martin's uh, question, if uh, evidence-based medicine is maybe a bit misunderstood in some contexts um, because I think 
there's a question of uh, what is cautiously relevant information. And that really depends on the context the information is needed. And I want to zoom this out in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of um, uh, if it's an immediate danger of sudden death, then you need, then you want information to be as costly in person styles, uh, actually uh, relevant as possible. I, and I want to connect that with Rani's comment on the aim of EBM seems to be to produce causal evidence useful for fi finding standard intervention in opposite to disposition, dispositionalism <laughs> uh, that would say that the, which treatment is best will depend on the particular case. And I want to say that, for example, in, in, uh, when, in, when considering tr the need for transplantation, organ trans transplantation, the medical teams will definitely uh, make a judgment on, uh, uh, on uh, whether the, the receiver, um, how much success we can expect. And they have to make these uh, judgments because they can't give this valuable organ and put it into any context, you know, it's not a, it's not a same, same situation. So they will consider like depression, uh, social relationships, uh, and all this before they find, uh, um, uh, yeah, who will get the organ. And that's very dispersionalistic way of thinking. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, and I think I can say this because I'm, uh, I've been, or my girlfriend is uh, soon to be a cardiologist and we are on very different uh, spectrums of health. Um, and we both value information and evidence, but we work in very, very different situations. So we have to use different maps. We have to use different models because we work in different terrains. Uh, in, in, so, I think there's so many, even before we you know, get into this very deeply rooted philosophical question of what is evidence and all this, uh, I think we also need to see that it's the usefulness is different depending on where you are in the spectrum. I think it's a very, very important point that can easily be misunderstood. Um, and I see this sometimes coming up in discussing this opposed to the other in terms of uh, so uh, and and I and just a final comment uh, back to the the cautiously relevant information because in, in the clinical encounter with a unique patient that's 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 usually the problem so clinicians and patients are really much the same because we value information differently and the big clinical challenge in the treatment room and in an educational setting is to get those to believe that our information is more culturally relevant than theirs. Uh, so even before we start to think about the usefulness of different models, we have to think about uh, uh, what situation, is the patient ready? to take in this, is, is the patient ready to reorganize or reconsider uh, his or her narrative? Is the clinician ready to, to value another kind of information than what they already got? So just- Sigurd, uh, this, Sigurd, this is really great. I think this is, um, as Maria was saying, you make such an important point. This is kind of the variation of the different aspects of elements of perspectives who are coming into this kind of relation within the evidence because it constantly depends where you start start do you start from the evidence do you start from the interaction from the context from the content from the question at hand from the so many viewpoints and it should not be the same but you have to get aware of where you're talking about before you start judging it isn't it that's also what you say and the more we understand it and be uh into it, the better it goes. Um, this is this is really helpful, I think. Uh, it's putting the, this point. Raj, you wanted to add something. So yeah, just again, uh, two, two really quick 
quick points. I think we're, we are all talking about the same the same thing is in. We've obviously all got the same desire, which is to do the best for, for everybody we can. Just just to clarify this sort of the problem of EBM, because I mean, it, that in itself is quite com confusing and open to misinterpretation. I don't believe that there is an issue of misinterpreting EBM itself because it's fairly clear on what it is, but identify the problem of it is, is often tricky. And and what what we mean, and again, Ron, Ronnie can sort of uh, adjust for accuracy, but in, in my lay speak, what we mean is, the problem is with the EBM model right from 1992 to now, reinforced by grade and, and yeah, you're absolutely right, Matt. Grade tries to, to, to develop this system where it's more patient focused, flexible, but there is still within the grade analysis of EBM, a very strict hierarchy, which very clearly, unambiguously, black and white says, this type of methodology is better than this type. And, that, and, that's, and that's the problem. That's the core of the problem because it, it de-emphasizes some sorts of uh, evidence, even scientific, even scientific evidence. And it does that based on a hierarchy, which is 100% based on internal validity, not external validity. It prioritizes methods that are able to internally control for variables better than another method. It's as simple as that. So it's, it says randomized control trials are better than observational studies because we can create causal associations from randomized control trials because we can control for its in, internal validity. And the payoff is external validity. And everybody accepts that. And like Maria says, you know, that context there then becomes critical. What we're trying to say is there are other equally scientific internally valid methods than just randomized control trials and above, even down to shop floor history taking, which is what we do. We, we behave as clinicians in what is traditionally a very scientific, very controlled way. We listen to some information, we develop hypotheses and we test those hypotheses in the history taking. You know, we're thinking what is causally relevant here from this patient? Let me, I'll generate a hypothesis and I'll ask some more questions and listen to the patient a bit more that in order to either refute or support what I'm thinking. We behave like scientists and, and um, but but then we have to get rid of the the regularities ontology that underpins evidence based medicine in order to make that that scientific. So what we're saying is there are more scientific methods that are needed to to come to the conclusion that something is called cause causation, not just randomized control trials. The other quick point I wanted to put, and, and again, you just mentioned it, is to re relate this back to education because. I, you know, we're, we're sat here and we're having these conversations and there's some very experienced clinicians, researchers, educators here. And there's also students who may well be going, what on earth is going on here? You know, what, how am I meant to interpret all this as a, as a, as a student if, if even these guys can't, can't work out the way the world should be? And I often worry about that, the conflicting messages we are giving to to, to our students. And on the one hand, they have a, they have a module which is all about evidence-based medicine. Then they go down to the corridor and have a module on how to be person-centered and, and all the time saying, but, but, but you know, you can't just make things up and stuff like, like this. And you can't, you can't do Reiki and you can't put crystal up somebody's backside or something. But so, so you know, how does that, I, I just don't know. How, how does this work in the mind mind of a of a, of a student? Is is my my next thing? So, oh, that Roger, that was actually directly the thing that I want to to go into. Uh, I would just just pick uh, Max and Noctula. Can you uh, at first just uh, react on it? From what they, do you take of it, Max? For example, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Well, at first, I feel like it's a bit overwhelming to, to hear all of you guys talk about all these nice solid uh, philosophies about uh, evidence-based medicine and uh, patient-centered care. And um, I feel like in our course, and maybe that's also the case in the UK, is that um, we, we as students get taught a way in which we have to use evidence to support the ways in which we view the patients and, and what we think is right to do. Um, but then in some ways, I think it's one of the most important things that I took from your discussion in this panel is 
um, putting that evidence that you get from all the research that has been done over the world, putting that into context and including the patient and looking at how um, you can use that evidence to um, kind of see what you can use and what you don't use. But I think it's kind of, for me, it's a bit confusing and overwhelming sometimes to what to believe, what not to believe and what evidence I should use, what evidence, what evidence I should disregard. And I think it's important in the education system that we teach students that it's okay maybe sometimes to not fully be comfortable in a situation where you get all this evidence where it's very overwhelming and how to like, I think Mario was the person who said it in the, in the chat that you have to contextualize the evidence that you get and how to, to, to understand that sometimes the evidence that you get might not apply to your patient or to the individual and accept that that's the case instead of just trying to always make sense of things and try to always look for a causality instead of just seeing things as they are and as they come. I think that's, for me, one of the biggest takeaways from this, uh, this panel. Thank you, Max. Uh, oh, yes, uh, Rani, you want to react first? Yeah, because my hand doesn't work uh, in the thing. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think this, this idea that uh, evidence is and all the costly irrelevant evidence can be given by statistics where you just count how often something happens uh, is really the, the big problem. I mean, I can understand if you know nothing, yeah, maybe that will help you to say that this works, this would produce the outcome more often than this if you have no idea. But then we also have to accept that the kind of causal evidence that we get is numbers needed to treat and numbers needed to harm. And that is not going to tell us who will be treated, who will be harmed. And that's a huge problem. I mean, we know that medicine is the fourth to sixth biggest cause of death um, in the Western world, and that's pretty bad. So if we really go about giving treatments without understanding how they work and for whom and at which points and under which conditions, it's, it's really more harmful than helpful. Thank you, Rani. Uh, Noctula, just put you in space. <laughs> yeah, um, I definitely agree with what Max said. And what Roger said was like, I was thinking the same thing. Like we have one module where it's purely evidence-based practice. And then we have another where it's like, it's all about the person. And I think in my first year and as a student, I really struggled with the concept of evidence-based practice because I think the way that I think, I think I, I think more in a person-centered way, just generally as I am as a person. So and then going to university and hearing all of this stuff about evidence, but then not really knowing how to input the evidence. And then it's like randomized controlled trials are best, but then you go down the corridor, it's like just talk to the patient and get to know the patient. And I think even on placement, that conflict is there because one of the ways that we're taught to like show our educators that we're doing well is to read evidence and then show them the evidence but then we're not really told to like sit there and talk to a patient and find out more about them that's not really something that we're told to do to show that you know we're being a good therapist I think like Max said it's just a bit overwhelming and confusing as a student to just be in this realm and then you go on Google Scholar and there's just so much there and you kind of don't know what to choose um, but I think the thing about just contextualizing it and putting the person first and then using the evidence to support what you know about the person is just a really helpful way to look at it. And I think even as a student, having sessions where we bring the two together and not having them so isolated might help the way that we think and process and learn how to use evidence in real life situations. Like in the third year, having sessions with Christine and other guests and kind of understanding that has been really helpful, but in first year, it was just a very complex, very complex thing. Thank you, Noctula. This is something always with complexity and how it is in learning. So we, in the meantime, we had a discussion concerning learning. How do we build up, like Steiner was saying, and also Noctula. In education, we most of the time, we have this tendency to start with a, um, with an, with a curriculum, which is an oversight, which is maybe a little bit small, and then we, we build on bigger, isn't it? So we add complexity to it. Although uh, with some of the people around here on the table, they have experienced a curriculum, uh, which is called the Delta Stream. And now 
it's uh, it's a curriculum in which complexity is at the heart. So there's no rules, there's no organization. Actually, uh, there's not even a plan. There's not even a schedule what to do from day one, and that's uh, voluntarily. And it sounds a little bit weird, but it sounds almost that it is the dispositionalism we started from day one. But maybe uh, that would be good if that fits in their minds. Maike, Jaap, maybe you can uh, give a little bit of your view on that one. Well, I was thinking about last September when we started the year and um, there were two uh, patients coming up and um, we had a first year group and a second year group. And um, they were talking and um, they had an interview. And after that, the patient said, well, the first years ask better questions than the second years because we were thinking about, oh, what could it be? What kind of questions should we ask? And the first year we're just asking about the person. They were curious about, um, yeah, what is the person in front of me instead of what do they need? What questions should I ask to get further with someone? Thanks, Maike. Uh, yeah, you want to add something? Yeah, I agree with, uh, with Maike on, uh, on that view. Because I think when you learn something, you want to, uh, you want to, but it's two positive angles. <laughs> you want to uh, apply, 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 apply your knowledge into uh, in your in your interview with the patient. But sometimes you forget that you are talking to a normal person that wants to get help, who wants to uh, get off his injury or just be there and talk and feel like talking to a normal person who can help them as a person to to be better. And that's I agree with Micah on that on that point on the on the, on the difference between the first years and the second years uh, students that the uh, yeah that the difference of your own uh, uh, interests uh, you forget the interest from yourself to the person so that the person that is the patient is more uh, yeah good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, the, that the patient is not uh, feeling. Yeah, I, 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 I can't explain it in the in, in oh, my. I think my, you want to say that um, we were just focusing on what the, the injury and all that stuff. Yeah, and, thank you. And not about the identity of, of the person. Yeah. That's exactly what I wanted to say. And but that didn't shifting come out thing well. was very <laughs> strange. Yeah. Because we should have done better, <laughs> but we didn't in the end. Yeah, but it's nice to have this kind of reflection on it. So what's happening? Um, now I just go, Evie, you wanted to react. Yeah, I just wanted to react to what Mike and, and Jaap said there. That was really interesting to hear because um, for myself, it has taken me many, many years since I qualified to be able to sit with a patient and have a conversation with them and not feel as if, honest to goodness, for many years after qualification, it felt as if there was an examiner or somebody sitting sitting behind me, um, like taking marks on whether I'd asked the patient the right questions, um, whether I'd followed up with things in the right way. It's funny how your education, it has such a huge impact on how you interact with the person in front of you. It's taken me years to unlearn um, being able to ask the right questions in the right order in this really structured way. So uh, yeah, I just uh, you took me back to took me back to those days with your answers. Thank you, Evie. Matt. Hi. Yeah. So I was um, sorry, just slightly distracted. Um, I was just thinking about how we might overcome some of these tensions, and I'm not sure we'll ever resolve them. But a part of me thinks that in terms of education, I'm just reflecting upon my journey, which may be quite similar to others, is perhaps um, having a greater, much more explicit way in clinical reasoning, you come to a hypothesis and you and you and you 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 consider the pros and cons, what is the weight of evidence towards or against a certain proposition? Um, perhaps a way that we could overcome something 
um, the, some of the difficulties is to make it more explicit the positions that we try to assert. And this is where philosophy comes in. So perhaps we should, in education, think about a dialectical relationship that exists between philosophy, sciences, and other things. Uh, so what commitments are we willing to assert? So, for example, if you're in an empirical analytical perspective, yeah, you'll, you, you will see things in a certain way uh, and you will come to some certain types of assumptions. If you look at things from an existentialist perspective, you're going to see things in a different way. The lived experience is going to be far more predominant. Yeah. Um, so what, 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 what perhaps might move things forwards in education is to be clear about a, the, the positions that we are willing to assert from different perspectives, not saying that one is necessarily better than the other, but to have this dialectical relationship between all of these things. I don't know if that's useful. Yeah, that is useful, Matt. They're definitely useful. And uh, it points out in these kind of dilemmas that we think of. Let's see if, uh, Beth, can you give your idea upon it? Like, yeah, um, I find it really interesting what the other students have said because it is really resonant, especially what Evie said as well about um, feeling like someone's watching you, almost like you're in an exam. That's that's I do resonate with that a lot, just checking you've asked all the right questions. And I think that sometimes can really pull you away from seeing the person in front of you because often you're in your own head trying to solve your own problems, um, like an investigation um, before just sitting and listening to someone. Um, and like Noctula said, it's a, it's a real um, just a position between the evidence based modules and the more person centred ones. But I do believe just as all of the clinicians here will hold their own stance, I don't think it's boxed in that way. I think there's a there's a spectrum between evidence based medicine, complete evidence based medicine and complete person centred care, because I think one can't really exist without the other. We can't just provide person-centred care if we don't have a clue about what our treatments are going to do, nor can we treat someone if we don't understand that they're an individual. Um, and I feel like as a student, you're at that crossroads where you're really considering what is it that I believe. Um, you're taught, always taught at Nottingham anyway, to always critically appraise everything you read, whether it's generalizable to your study. And I think that's kind of summarizing what we're learning today. Like, that these massive studies aren't generalizable to one specific person and I think that's that's kind of where it starts like when you question that like what I'm learning can't be specific to every single person I encounter um, and the contextualizing evidence is, is really important um because because everyone's completely different and I do understand that there's kind of an interplay to be had between the two different approaches but to, to say that goes against, like Roger said, e, EBM is, is, if you question it, then it's not EBM anymore, which is difficult. And then person-centered care, if you consider that approach, then are you then going in favor of EBM? It, it's difficult and it's a spectrum, I think. Um, but I think that all develops with confidence, as Evie said, once you start to develop the type of clinician you are away from directly what you're taught, um, as everyone will do. And that's why there's such a, a difference in each clinician and the way they approach their patients. I think you start to learn the type of person you are and what you value. Um, and I think that does actually stem from how you'd wish to be treated as a patient. And from what I've read from Christine's blogs, they, they've been really insightful for me as a student to understand the patient perspective and why people aren't treated as, as people, sometimes more of a problem or to solve. Um, and I think if I was, patient and I was getting treated that I'd want to be treated with a person-centered approach which is kind of what strives me um, as a clinician. Thank you Beth. This was, uh, you really provided with a nice insight in the way you, you put it in, how the tension, how you feel it, what it does it mean for you. This is a nice, it felt also a reflection in this. It was really great. Um, in this one, if, if you, uh, from your perspective, I don't know some things that you think with all those people around that you think, well, now I can ask some question. Is there something that you like to be more clarified or you dive deeper into it? I know I've put you on the spot, but... Uh, 
Sorry, is that to me? Yes, yes, please. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, no, 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 don't worry, don't worry. Can you repeat the question? I think no, I, was just wondering, I was just wondering because you had some nice insight and you give uh, a nice put things together. Then I was just wondering, are there some items that you like to, to dive a little bit deeper into? Or Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think I've, I've never really, I, did, I have to admit, I didn't know much about this before I sat here today, like an hour and a half ago. Um, and this is is definitely triggered a lot of thoughts in me, a lot of reflection. Um, and I, I do think it, it, it's, it's, it is an interplay, I think. And I think you've got to decide where you sit um, within that. Um, and I do think students are often, as, as someone mentioned, sorry, I can't remember the name, but um, first year is literally just anatomy, basically. It's drilling in what's wrong with the patient, how you find that. And I think that's quite hard to dismantle when you get through the years, um, because then all of a sudden this new concepts come in about, okay, so pain can be far more complex. You've got to find their pain drivers. You've got to consider um, that something other than uh, the biomedical model can be causing their pain. And I think that's then trying to get your head around that whilst trying to dismantle some of those thoughts that you were taught, fundamentals that you were taught um, that you have to question um, and I think it takes that reflective pro process and, and events like this to realise as a student that sometimes some of the um, processes and things you've learned have been slightly problematic <laughs> um, not in a bad way because they are valuable lessons to learn um, but problematic in the sense that can you fully see someone as a whole person unless you're taught that from day one yeah I think this is a nice reflection and this is a, it's this, this, the, the whole point with dismantling is something that happens and maybe this dismantling process is as important uh, as anything else but it is excellent to, to go in the patient centeredness and the thing that we build upon and how we have to uh, so, so we, we are ingrained from the first year in a specific way of thinking but it's very hard to come, ac come across. So you have to start reflecting only by reflective practice, as you say, and uh, it takes effort. And you have to be uh, um, uh, open to it from yourself and at the same time connected to it. Um, Laura, you wanted to react. Yeah, I just wanted to say, so thanks Beth. I think what you've just sort of like, had, I've just had a little mind boom as you were talking and I was like that's that's it isn't it really so and this is the difference between teaching adults and teaching say for example naive children when we bring people into university we we almost have this idea and this structure of building up the body so we're like okay we're going to start out in simple anatomy and then we're going to build up complexity and build and build and build but we're forgetting that the people that are coming on our universities are already adults. They already have an understanding of the complexity of life. They've already lived complex lives and had complex experiences of pain and injury and health and suffering and trauma and all of that. And so then what we're doing is we're almost, we're almost like going back down into this really, really oversimplified abstract model that creates conflict in that first year, that friction in that first year of, well, how does this, what does this have anything to do with my life? And then we're sort of over theorizing and removing the complexity. And then we're trying to create and synthesize more complexity that, that is just more and more abstract from what the person already had as a, as a human and adult experience. And, and I think, and as I was thinking, I was thinking back to my own training and when I was trained and I, I had spent two years working in a hospital as a nursing assistant and then went into university and all of a sudden I was thinking, well, what the, what the, what the hell has the psoas muscle got to do with all this? Like, it was a kind of, how, how does that help somebody, you know, walk from the bed to the bathroom? I mean, I don't understand how this makes any sense to me because it was oversimplifying it. And that oversimplification doesn't serve the students. It doesn't serve the patients. It only serves the teachers. And that's the problem. And we need to have a serious, mature and honest look at how we are developing our, our andragogy, our adult education, and realise that we are talking to already complex humans with complex life experience so sorry thank you that was my <laughs> oh thank you well done. nice uh, nice laura if i i think it's also something that uh, christine put in the chat it's um that even in the first year 
um, it kind of sounds like now we are all, the only thing we got taught in the first year is anatomy and all the basic principles. And I think uh, Paul touched on that in um, a recent comment. He said that it's the line between explaining complex things um, without making them too simple, but it's like teaching teaching something that's very complex, but comprehend, comprehensible for the students. And I think it's, you, you put it beautifully, Laura, you have to maybe put it in a very complex situation and kind of expect students to already grasp part of parts of it instead of oversimplifying it and then teaching it in a very simple way, um, which kind of results in the fact that we um, start to think very simply and oversimplifying things and then have to break them down over and over again as we get taught new things in the process of the, over the course of the years. So yeah, that's something that I, I noticed in my uh, second year that in the first year you get taught all these principles and all these um, all these models and all these anatomy structures. And then in the second year, you get taught a lot about um, the patient-centered care and how you have to talk to the individual whilst still recalling all the information you get put in your head in the first year. And it's very, it, it, it gets taught alongside each other in a parallel, but I think it's like, I think it was Beth who said it perfectly. You have to kind of um, find a way in which you can put the two together and, and see how you can put the two uh, opposed to each other and have a conversation about how you can imply both uh, strategies and both ways in which you can learn. I think that's a very, a very good point. And I think we should end at least here at uh, the Han. We could really apply that in the education. And maybe you you can touch on that with uh, the Delta education. Oh, thank you, thank you, uh, Max. I think that we we on, in the meantime we uh, we move into the discussion a little bit towards education. Also in the chat, uh, it's between models, evidence-based practice. Uh, so what's actually what are we doing uh, and things? So how are we looking upon it? I think that uh, in a lot of times when education we have the tendency to to start on oh, it has to be an oversight, but actually we can quite easily do everything at the same time and which is meaning, uh, make it meaningful for the ones who are learning. And I think that that's the part, but there's also sometimes in the discussion is physiotherapy of the profession, is it something which is stable or is it ongoing in itself? And if that one is ongoing and the learner is ongoing and the clinicians are ongoing, so everything is changing. So we have changing systems who interact with each other. So we can also build up an educational system to work upon that way that is not so fixed and that you constantly change it so that the confrontation between the confrontation or the interaction between people definitely makes something new. But it means also that perhaps that we have this philosophical ba basis we have to start way more with. So the way of thinking so that we at least challenge each other, maybe not even explicit, but also implicit. Uh, and at the same time, I think that the patient centered from what we are as humans, but also for the patients among us and the different perspective, as Matthew put it out, the intersubjective space between a patient and a therapist needs to be an analogy, I think, between in the intersubjective space between an educator and a student, because I think that both, just, those are just roles, both are learners, so we are constantly developing with each other. Uh, that's how I perceive education in itself as an ongoing process that we constantly emerge in. Although sometimes we also have systems attached to it, which ask for different things, but that would be nice sometimes just to, to work around. This is just, um, well, I don't know if it's helpful, but uh, um, I think it would be good to see because we constantly circle back to different things. Uh, and actually I wanted to ask Rani and Christina, if we just look now on education from a philosophical or from patient perspective. We talked quite a lot on patient perspectives. Uh, we talked about philosophy, uh, education. What are your thoughts about it? Shall I go first? Yes. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I, I counter this with, I don't know enough about how physiotherapy is taught in university. So anything about, I'm about to say, you know, if I've got it wrong, then, then just ignore it. But to me, I, I assume that physiotherapists come into, into their profession because they care about people um, and they want to improve people's lives. And that's at the heart of it. <clears throat> um, my past profession um, was teaching. And most teachers, probably not all, 
uh, probably not all physiotherapists either, they go into the teaching profession because they care and are interested in children, not in, so I was taught mathematics. So it wasn't about me being, you know, obsessed with mathematics. It was me wanting to be able to support students to learn something that, that was really important. So to me, if a, a good education for physiotherapists has to start with, with people and about how to communicate with people and how to understand people. Um, and less so about anatomy and so on, because I mean, of course, they're the, the tools of the trade, I would call it, um, and are important. But if you're going to be good clinicians, then you've got to be able to work with people. And if I look back at my first four years when I had loads and loads of clinicians, they probably mirrored the university, what I think might be a university syllabus. So they were interested in my anatomy. They were interested in my MRI. And as it happens, my MRI doesn't actually show the level of the, the condition and pain that, that I lived with. Um, and it's only when, you know, almost I went through maybe more advanced clinicians, I don't know, that I started to get clinicians that looked at me and communicated with me and were interested in, in me as a person. And that's when my clinical care took a different level. So, so what I'm trying to say is that to me, the, the most fundamental thing that I would have thought that needs to be supported and taught in universities is the communication and the understanding of people and the other things become tools in the toolbox. But I might have got it wrong. <laughs> I think this is wonderful how you put it, Christine. And uh, an important perspective, definitely. And you, you gave a, a good point. Um, Rani, can you give your uh, addition as well? Yeah, so uh, I think it was really interesting to hear Beth talk about the first year and the second year students, uh, where the first year students were more open and used more their... Uh, might say your intuition or your general knowledge because when you go into uh, any kind of study any kind of discipline whatever you you study you will very typically be educated into a paradigm so one set of thinking with one set of theories methods issues problems solutions how to interpret the data i mean you become an expert at looking at things from that quite narrow perspective and and of course I have to think that uh, what we do in course health is something that is relevant for for education because one thing that we really want people to understand this is that you know when you get in and you become an expert and you get this kind of narrow perspective you have been given a perspective that is a perspective so so any kind of method you use is not the only method that you could use all methods are introduced as solutions to other to problems that other methods got. So, and the same with theory. So, so all kind of science and research develops. And I think it's important that education doesn't make you arrogant uh, towards other types of perspectives, but instead that you become more humble because you can see that from the more expert you become, the more things do you have to leave out. And, and that's also why we think that people should work uh, also more interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary, because then you can get these other perspectives. And instead of saying those people are idiots because they don't do it in the evidence-based way or they don't look at the evidence, you know, uh, you could instead say that, well, actually they are looking at statistical difference makers. We are looking at causal mechanisms and those things will complement each other. So one thing that we work on now is, is uh, try to explicating the kind of um, uh, implicit biases that are 
really up for discussion the philosophical biases, you know. So, for instance, once people start saying, oh, those people are reductionists, you know, that is at least more informative than saying that they're idiots or they don't get it right, you know. So, so because reductionism can always be discussed. So it's to bring up this new level of, uh, of knowledge and awareness that gives you humility instead of arrogance, because I see a lot of cr critical thinkers uh, and people who are really into science on Twitter. And basically what they do is say whatever they learned in their paradigm and to ditch uh, knowledge that comes from other perspectives. And, and to me, that is not critical thinking. Oh, wonderful, Rani. Thank you. Sigurd and Christine afterwards. Yes. No, it just made me think of one of my absolute favorite blog posts written by uh, Roger the Great Kerry, which uh, which was named uh, I don't get paid to think this hard. And maybe Roger could uh, reiterate uh, the main points of the of the post, but but the thing was that uh, maybe even students and clinicians they didn't really sign up for the, the, the big, I didn't expect it to be this complex. And also made me think of Laura's um, uh, idea about uh, maybe it starts out too simple. I think we have to set them up for the task very early on, I actually, that, well, you signed up for physio, it's way more complex than you think, and we need to start there. Um, but, and in terms of Roger's past, is how much can we expect from people, clinicians, patients as well? It's like the patient also says, I, didn't, I don't get paid enough to think this hard in my own treatment. There are, there are elements in here. Uh, and, and maybe that's uh, even with clinical encounters. Um, a very important point is to is to is to level out the expectations. What do you want? What do you need out of this appointment today? I don't want it to be difficult. I don't want it to be complex. <laughs> I don't want to think. I've been thinking so much already. I'm, my journey is 15 years. My GPs, uh, several hospital experts, insurance, uh, social welfare, my family, everyone is involved. I don't want to think now. So maybe we need to start out there just like there are similar uh, similar um, points uh, that can be made uh, from clinicians to new students to patients. Um, and, and maybe it's about expectations even before you start out on the on the journey with whatever journey it is. Um, Great. Thank you, Sigurd. Uh, Christine, you want to react? And then uh, maybe after? Yeah, I guess I just wanted to, to add something. I mean, you know, one of the, the values of discussions like this is that there are people from different professions and different stages in the profession and, and patients and so on. And I, I think that's hugely valuable. So I would set a challenge actually to people who design physiotherapy higher education university courses to say, well, when you design your courses, why don't you have at the table um, a range of people? Why don't you have uh, patients who, who can add to it, philosophers, other people, and looking at the basic design and, and how things should be spread across the years? A little challenge. Great, right. it's a nice challenge. Thank you, Christine. Evie. Uh, yeah, great, lovely challenge, uh, Tina. That was great. But I, I also just wanted to respond to Sigurd there. I thought he made a really good point and it's something that's been on my mind too, that when we think patients, you know, not all, it sounds obvious, that, but not all patients are the same. Not every patient wants um, to, to consider the, the ontology that their physiotherapist is basing their treatment on, you know? Um, definitely not all patients are like Tina, not all, not all patients would be like me when I go to my physio. Um, everyone is, yeah, totally different. So um, students don't get freaked out. Some people just, um, you know, are, are happy enough to, yeah, not think too deeply about it. If that's any consolation to any of you. Yeah, thank you. 
definitely is. I think this this kind of discussion, you no know, conversation and dialogue brings us forward. And I think that one of the most important parts is that uh, it's the judging sometimes of each other is one of the most difficult points. And the moment we start, we stop with judging, and then we st- we start by being curious. Because whatever we do, we constantly are in interaction with people. And now what we have, we have students, clinicians, academics, patients, everybody together. And the moment we show curiosity and start exploring who we are and what we think, we definitely can keep on learning with each other and we will change our mindset. Instead of saying, from, this is the right way. So it's not about the right way. It's about being open towards different ways with each other, from each other. I think that we had a lovely conversation and uh, we're slowly going to end this conversation for now, although I hope this conversation is more open-ended than closing. And I hope for most of us, it will leave us with more questions than answers because I always love to have end up with questions because that keeps us curious instead of having the answers because then we think we're done. Now we can sit back and relax and now we know it all. Well, one thing for sure. I know less than when I started today. So that for me is at least a very nice point and I love it in this way. Um, so for to the ending, is there somebody who likes to add something or um, comment, question? Are there any more questions that you think, well, well, this is the moment to put challenges, questions out in the open. Now we can have it. See good. Just made me think of uh, one thing that uh, changed in my clinical practice and um, in terms of changing expectations early. And that is, maybe it has something to do with courage uh, to when you when you get a a person in your office and and they have this long complex history. And I think like many years ago, I didn't have the courage to to say well i'm sorry to hear you have this journey but if we're going to change this it will take much more than what you think maybe and we need to start there and i didn't have the courage to go there before but now i do that uh, as a reflex i don't spend time on on trying not to bring in the full picture uh, of course, sometimes I will I will open up that discussion and and and, and give the give. Of course, I need the alliance uh, and make the atmosphere to 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 make that discussion happen and or or, or a, like a bidirectional reflection. But I didn't have that courage before, and maybe if it's one last comment, maybe that's also for the educators and also for students uh, to to take this challenge earlier in the in the education and also in the in the clinical encounter that yeah right courage. thank you thank you courage that's the way to go thank you sigurd uh hank yes um I, th- I think that's a very uh, good thing you write said, uh, write said about the courage thing. Um, I think it all has to do with uncertainty. We're not certain of all these complex things we have um, in our decision making together with the patient. Um, but as I said in the chat already, actually we do it every day. On a daily basis, we make the most complex decisions uh, what clothes to wear, what to eat, what, and those are many things we think about. Um, and we're not scared of that uncertainty as well. And we have to learn to embrace the, the complexity uh, and just get into it and embrace that we don't know everything. Um, and uh, I think that's also the courage you have to get into. Yes. Thank you, Hank. I think that uh, what we move into, this is really nice. It's about charitable and courage. I think that the thing that is our on our agenda now for all of us, or that is me, the activist, who's saying, maybe we have to move from a uh, safe space to a brave space together. 
being courageous, daring to reach out, daring to confront yourself and the other, daring to confront your own thoughts and helping and facilitate the other, being there with and for each other. And uh, let's build on in this kind of thing. I want to thank you all very much for this whole meeting. Thank you for all the guests here on the table and this wonderful conversation. And I think this is just the start of something which we might call well, Course Health Ed, with all we can do together, if Rani exclaims. Yes, thank you very much. I